Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today is going to be part 5 of my Ultimate General Gettysburg uh, Let's Play series. It's been a couple of days since I've posted anything, I've been a little bit busy with some personal stuff, uh, but now I'm back and uh, getting into the play. Um, as you can see, or if you remember from my previous videos, July 1st went almost perfectly for the Union forces under my command, and uh, this is a Let's Play from the Union side. And the Union troops were holding their ground steadily throughout the entire 1st of July, with uh, standing several historical attacks which drove them from the field in real life, but we were able to maintain our positions. It wasn't until just before nightfall that we driven out of our positions north of Gettysburg to the historical defensive line around Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. On the start of July 2nd, we regained the momentum, launching a couple of successful attacks against the Confederate forces on our right flank, uh, but now it appears the Confederates are finally trying to regain the momentum and launch counterattacks against us. The situation is as follows. Sir, our forces are in place around the cemetery, but word is the rebels are bringing in reinforcements from the north to threaten our flank. We must act before our flank collapses. Most of the Army of the Potomac is here, and we won't be receiving reinforcements. The cemetery sector is a strong defensive area, and if we lose it, we will risk being driven off the field and losing the battle. We can't afford to lose more ground, but the Confederates will be pressuring us heavily. God be with you, General. So as you can see here, we're not receiving reinforcements, but we start with a huge force of 39,787 soldiers and 96 artillery pieces. That's the largest army uh, that I've fought in a battle of Ultimate General Gettysburg so far. The Confederates, meanwhile, start off outnumbered more than 2 to 1. They start with 18,615 soldiers and 92 guns. They will be receiving, however, 11,791 soldiers and 34 guns as reinforcements, so they will end up outnumbering us with artillery and uh, they will still end up being outnumbered by about 10,000 men in terms of infantry, but the Confederacy, if they are on the offensive, has the advantage of picking their uh, picking where they want to attack. So we're going to have to be more spread out so we can defend everywhere. They can choose to attack in certain locations, and that can help negate our advantage in numbers because we'll have more men spread out more thoroughly unless we are able to launch an effective counterattack against their own attack. But that's enough talking. Let's go ahead and get started. So here you can see the Second Corps uh, under General Winfield Scott Hancock, one of the best Union Corps commanders of the war. Interestingly enough, he only gets two stars here. I find that uh, pretty fascinating considering Hancock historically uh, was a big part in rallying the Union Army on the evening of July 1st and played a significant role in July 2nd coming to Sickles' aid as well as uh, basically partaking in the most famous uh, defensive uh, posture, I don't know, posture, the most famous defensive engagement uh, during the Battle of Pickett's Charge. So, it as a two-star, um, but I guess, you know, everyone has their own opinion. He fought very well later in the war. He had a, toward the end of the war when he was suffering from some war wounds, uh, including some that he had uh, sustained at Gettysburg, he did lose some of his effectiveness, but he was, by and large, one of the best Union commanders of, of the war, uh, in terms of the Eastern Theater, anyway. Uh, Grant definitely thought a lot of him when he reorganized the army. Grant made sure that the Second Corps under Hancock was actually the largest and most powerful Union Corps uh, at the start of the Overland Campaign. All right, so you can see here we've got quite a large force on our right flank where we've driven the enemy back. Uh, it looks like there are enemy cavalry up there, so we're going to bring our cavalry. Uh, and maybe we'll have a good old-fashioned cavalry fight, because they're threatening our flank, but we've got some troops here. So it looks like General Stewart's Cavalry Brigade is uh, involved here. Now, you can see what I mean by having our troops spread out. We've got uh, quite a few troops down here in the south who don't appear to be doing much. Uh, meanwhile, on the north here, the Confederates are launching heavy attacks against a small portion of our force. Uh, so definitely something to be wary of. Again, up north here near Benner Hill, uh, the Confederacy hasn't launched anything yet, although they do have quite a holy cow, lots of cavalry. Wow, that's a lot of horse. Confederates are launching a massive attack. I'm not too worried about my right flank here. Uh, these troops kind of on Culp's Hill are almost redundant in the sense that we've got a lot of troops up uh, to the north here. So we're, our flank's kind of already protected by the troops on Benner Hill unless the enemy comes straight into our rear. 
These are huge Confederate brigades that are coming against us, though. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hope that the Confederates are not going to launch an attack here around our flank at Workert's Farm. I'm going to pull these troops out of line and uh, swing them north to try and hit the Confederates in their flank. Should hopefully help relieve some of this pressure that's on us. Got a lot of brigades which have fought uh, most of this battle so far. Confederates have some very large and I'm guessing fresh brigades. Because these are huge. They're like 1,700 men. We've got some fresh troops as well though. It looks like they're trying to bring Posey in around our flank on Benner Hill. But we've got some troops here on Culp's Hill which will help negate that. And then you can see here there's large the large cavalry detachment. They are kind of pushing back the 12th Corps flank, uh, but we can reform that, and we've got a lot of cavalry here, or a lot of infantry. Cavalry doesn't do the best job at pushing back infantry in this game, which is historical. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, the role of cavalry was very much um, in the decline. They were much more of a scouting force and a skirmishing force uh, or a, uh, being used as kind of mobile infantry type force. They were less effective when it came to cavalry charges. Uh, there were only a handful of charges during the entire Civil War. And that's because during the Civil War, it was the first engagement in which you saw a new technology uh, really take hold and become um, the, the principal uh, weapon of choice, that being the rifled musket. At the start of the war, a lot of units still used smoothbore muskets in the vein of the Napoleonics, which is basically just a smooth barrel without any rifling that shoots a round lead ball out of it. Uh, the ball often bounces so it kind of hops down the tube and as you can imagine that makes it very inaccurate. Um, at close range it could be devastating because it could actually pack grape shot in there so it was often used much like a shotgun uh, in close ranges but at longer ranges it was incredibly inaccurate bullets could randomly swing up, swing down, swing left, swing right. Uh, whereas the rifled musket introduced some, probably the first time we see something similar to a, um, and I'm leaving this, well, in case any troops come through the wheat field, I kind of want to leave one regiment here to prevent us from getting outflanked. So hopefully these three regiments can flank the Confederates well enough here. Um, but the rifled musket introduced the first kind of appearance of what we would consider a bullet to, in modern times. Uh, it was a bullet that was kind of rounded. It wasn't. It didn't have a metal jacket or anything. It was just a lead ball that was kind of shaped like a bullet, if you will. It was called the Minet uh, bullet, which was named after its French designer. I don't remember his last name, but his, his first name, or maybe it was his last name. Anyway, his name is Minet, uh, which is where the bullet got its name. Um, it was a big development because uh, what would happen is rifled muskets would have a bit of a curvature in their bullet or in their barrels. So they were similar to rifles. They weren't, um, I don't know the exact details. I know they were not the same thing as a full blown rifle. Uh, so there were some differences between rifled muskets and actual rifles. Uh, you still had units that had rifles, sharpshooter units that had rifles uh, during the Civil War. And um, these units were a little bit uh, different than the standard line infantry. But anyway, standard line infantry had these uh, rifled muskets, which allowed them to have much more accurate fire. Instead of the bullet or the Minet bullet bouncing its way down the barrel, uh, they actually would uh, spin and get a curvature to them. So you saw much larger, longer ranges. Now the bullets still tended to flatten out, especially on impact. So you still got a lot of really grisly wounds because the bullets were still lead balls, which meant that you saw lots of times where the bullet, it was soft lead. So when it hits your bone, it actually spreads out uh, into a very large diameter and would shatter the bone rather than passing through it like a modern bullet, which meant that a lot of wounds were simply untreatable and led to amputations during this time frame. Um, but it was also more accurate. So as I was saying, our cavalry became somewhat obsolete around this time period as far as stand-up line cavalry that would launch charges against enemy troops. Uh, because what would happen is instead of a infantry regiment only having, a, having an effective range of maybe 80, 90 yards tops, uh, as was the case with smoothbore uh, bullets, 
you had units that could effectively fire out to over 160 yards. The average range of an engagement increased from 100 yards to around 160 yards with rifled muskets. And theoretically, the muskets had even larger range than that. They could shoot out to a couple hundred yards. Which meant if a cavalry unit was trying to charge into the infantry, they couldn't kind of slowly approach the infantry and then charge last second. They'd have to charge over a much greater distance, which meant that the horses would become more winded and less effective as they grew closer. And it also meant that the, um, the defending infantry often could get off two, maybe even three shots before the cavalry would uh, impact their lines as opposed to in Napoleonic time frames, you probably were only going to get one volley off. Uh, and this meant that um, you essentially had a much more uh, devastating uh, defensive fire that would approach any kind of cavalry charge, which made them much less practical. Not to mention, being on a giant horse is a beautiful target. Uh, if you don't hit the soldier, it doesn't matter. If you hit his horse, you know, you're going to knock him off his horse and he's not really an effective charging force anymore. So the whole Napoleonic kind of heavy, heavy cavalry with lancers and muskets, or not muskets, lancers, uh, was not so in vogue, if you will, during the Civil War. Uh, when you compare it with uh, the Napoleonics just a couple of years before, or even the Mexican-American War just a couple of years before. And see here, we're kind of being pushed back by the Confederate cavalry from um, Benner Hill. I'm trying to, you can see General Custer up here, trying to keep this flank secure. I've got a lot of troops that are unengaged. Actually, Custer's going to come down here behind the enemy lines. I've also got a lot of artillery that's unengaged as well enemy is threatening. A lot of my troops on Culp's Hill are, are battered units that have been fighting the entire war, so we've got some, or entire battle, so we've got some, you know, units that are not in the best shape trying to hold those lines. Looks like the enemy's driven us back from that main opening, and they're now kind of occupying the stone wall. However, we've fallen back into some pretty good defensive terrain. I'm going to swing Ward around here. He's only got 1% morale. Where is the Corps Commander? Zook's Brigade will swing north. Harrow is going to swing wide. Von Glace and Hall will advance. We also devastated an enemy artillery battery. You can see here the enemy now has 121 guns and 25,000 soldiers. We've got 34,000 soldiers and 78 guns. So we've lost almost 20 guns, uh, which is not something we can really afford to do. But... I don't think the enemy is going to bring any troops in here, the, the Peach Orchard, so I'm going to bring Graham's Brigade up in reinforcement and bring Paul's Brigade up as well. I'm kind of stripping the troops in the south uh, to kind of try and flank the Confederacy, try and flank their long line here. You can see here another enemy uh, artillery battery just devastated. So... The other thing with cavalry charges is artillery uh, was becoming more and more rifled as opposed to during Napoleonic times you had uh, smoothbore cannons pretty much you, as your only artillery piece. And during the Civil War, a large percentage of the artillery pieces became rifled, which meant effective artillery fire, while not terribly accurate, especially on the Confederate side against infantry at very long ranges, could be much more effective against large targets like horses. So the battlefield was becoming much more difficult to operate while mounted. Cavalry still had a huge use in using it as unmounted infantry, or mounted infantry that allowed them to swing around the battlefield and operate um, as an effective kind of mobile force, uh, but it wasn't the same sort of cavalry use as was the case during the Napoleonics again. You can see here the enemy is kind of threatening to drive us back uh, from uh, Culp's Hill. They're bringing a large percentage of their troops down here. I'm fighting a very disorganized fight, if you will. They're using their rapid mobility against us. We're still holding Benner Hill. Looks like most of their troops to the north have kind of gone away. Maybe we'll use Custer against these guys. Um, but the enemy is really... I'm surprised they haven't taken it yet. But they're threatening Culp's Hill, which would be a, a big no-no. It would be very bad to lose Culp's Hill. Meanwhile, on their left flank, we're really sweeping them from the field, or at least we're threatening to. We're driving them back pretty effectively uh, with these brigades here that we've got on our left. So it's kind of a tale of two flanks with our right flank, or kind of maybe even center. Culp's Hill is almost like our center, so um, being a little bit uh, exposed and uh, threatened, and I don't have a whole lot of reserves. 
bring Kelly up, but his brigade is incredibly small. I'll bring Zook up, but again, his brigade's pretty small. I could pull standard, but then there'd be no reserves here on our center if the Confederates launch another attack, but I don't have much of a choice. <sighs> Stupid ca cavalry charges up Culp's Hill is absolute bull. I'm sorry, but that's just ridiculous. Culp's Hill was an incredibly wooded for fortress. There is absolutely no way in hell any cavalry troops would be able to charge up that hill and have any measure of success. That's just 100% garbage. Come on, guys, get into position. So this is kind of a cluster. Oh, Cutler just decided to charge up there and he's driving the enemy skirmishers back, so that's cool. Are there any enemy victory points that we need to try and seize? I don't see anything. I think it's just a matter of holding our ground. Looks like we're about to lose Culp's Hill, though. See, this cavalry just charging down out of blue is just bull. I guess they're retreating. That's why they're all white. But now they're in our rear, and everything's retreating from them. That's just garbage. They should be absolutely destroyed or surrendered or something. I don't know if... Can units surrender? I don't think they can surrender in this game. Oops. I don't want to move you there. Alright. You guys are going to have to launch attacks against these guys. So they just like ran through my entire line and all my guys got disorganized. I don't get that at all. But we're still flanking them at least. We've got a huge force coming in behind the enemy lines. So that's good. I think the enemy's routing from the field. I'm not really sure. These guys look like they're still loading and firing on the enemy. These guys not so much. We're going to pull these guys up. And Smith's kind of a reserve now. Paul's going to swing over here. We're launching an attack on Culpsil, which somehow we haven't lost yet. Despite the enemy being all over it, literally. Benner's Hill is still in our control. Nice job, Custer. <sighs> I don't even know where my core commanders are. I don't see any... I mean, I see Hancock. Is he the only core... I thought I had the 12th core commander on the field, too, somewhere. Oh, yeah, he's up there. There should be other corps commanders on the field, though, because a lot of these units are members of different corps. There we go. That artillery firing into the flank of the enemy there. Let's use dismounted infantry. Enemy's flanking Webb up here, so that's not good. Bring some reinforcements. So far, things are going okay. Again, we're kind of flanking the enemy, so that's definitely very good, but they've got a huge artillery. It looks like a large artillery battery up here on whatever ridge that is. Probably Seminary Ridge. So the enemy is retreating as we flank them. Which means I can swing more troops over here to help. Bring up Coster's Brigade. A general envelopment is definitely occurring on the enemy left. Or on our left. So we're having some success there. We barely held on to Benner Hill. Our line in the center is just absolutely, totally, totally messed up. Huge bulge in our lines. This is kind of like the Civil War Battle of the Bulge, sort of. Looks like we are driving the enemy back. We haven't fully lost Culp's Hill yet, which I'm totally confused by. General advance on the left. Things are going pretty well. I have to bring some of these artillery batteries up to support the attack. I'm not sure where the high ground is. It's kind of hard to tell. 
But uh, yeah, so there was a lot more artillery. There were a lot more uh, rifled cannons as well, which made cavalry charges more difficult because you had uh, larger numbers of uh, artillery weapons firing at longer ranges, uh, being more effective against horse. Uh, so there were there was kind of a combination of things. Now cavalry did have some advantages that it didn't have in previous wars, in that uh, it started using uh, repeating rifles before infantry did. So that allowed them to really multiply their firepower in a way that wasn't possible in the past. Um, so that's one thing that gave them an edge. And there's a certain truth to it that, that really helped the Union Cavalry at the Battle of Gettysburg, that uh, General Buford's troops had some more repeating rifles than the Confederates did. So it made them seem like they had more men in line, perhaps, than they did historically. Not historically, but in, in reality. Um, but uh, with that being said, it was much more of a kind of a, a mobile infantry. Uh, we lost Gulps Hill. It was much more of a, a mobile infantry than it was anything else. Um, it wasn't something that was going to break the line. It wasn't used when an enemy was in retreat. You weren't going to launch a cavalry charge to finish them off. Um, during the Napoleonic Wars, cavalry charges could break entire armies or drive entire armies from the field. Uh, what was it, like 9,000, 10,000 cavalry charged at one point during the Battle of Waterloo? They failed to break the uh, British lines, but um, in other battles, like the Battle of Ulay, uh, start E-L-Y, something like that, in uh, modern-day Russia, or was it Poland? Um... Uh, a massive cavalry charge, one of the largest of the Napoleonic Wars, actually didn't break the line, but it, it caused the enemy so much disruption and so many casualties that it more or less stopped their advance temporarily until uh, Napoleon was able to deploy some further reinforcements. So uh, cavalry was a, a vital weapon during the Napoleonics and it was increasingly marginalized. There was one last major cavalry charge uh, that occurred in history that I'm aware of against a modern force and that occurred during the Franco-Prussian War. And there can be, there's some truth to it that it kind of it legitimized the idea that cavalry was still a viable force on the battlefield. Uh, it occurred after the Battle of Sedan, I believe. Um, or either right before, but basically it was during the early phases of the Franco-Prussian War, and it, in, in commanders' minds, it said, oh yeah, cavalry still can be used, despite the fact that every single charge before then was a bloody disaster, and was demonstrating the pure futility of cavalry charges, especially against infantry who were increasingly wielding uh, automated weapons. Not automated as in, like, machine guns, but, like, rapid-fire weapons. So it's interesting to see generals fail to grasp that. And you still had some cavalry charges during World War I, none of which were of any success against, again, well-mobilized major armies. Um, so that's, that's it's another example of uh, the Civil War kind of foretelling the future of, of modern conflict and uh, much in the way that the Overland Campaign had, um, you know, had um, trench warfare toward the end of the Civil War, and uh, generals didn't really catch on. I mean, to be fair, uh, the Americans were kind of viewed as, as uh, second-class soldiers to most of uh, European officers. Uh, there was They were kind of scoffed at because American soldiers weren't trained how to uh, form a square, which is one of the most basic and important uh, infantry formations of the time. Just that, to resist a cavalry charge, you'd basically form up where you'd instead of being in one long line you'd form essentially four lines all linking up with each other where you'd present bayonets and it would make an incredibly difficult uh, target for cavalry to try and charge and break. It was very rare for a square once formed to be broken by cavalry and uh, British advisors kind of looked down on the Americans for not teaching their soldiers how to form these things and not knowing how to form these things, despite the fact that there really wasn't much need for them because a single line of infantry firing volley fire into a, a determined cavalry charge in this age was almost suicide. You know, there was a chance it would succeed. It wasn't quite as futile as, as 10 years later or, what is, six years later during the Franco-Prussian War. But it was definitely not a practical weapon of warfare anymore, and yet uh, traditions held sway. You tend to see that, where the, the next war is fought by the previous war's tactics, essentially, and then the following war learns. Um, that's not true in every case, but you certainly do see that happen quite a bit. You can see here the battle has been delayed. Uh, we are launching attempts to retake Culp's Hill, but I don't think I'm going to, uh, which is kind of concerning. It's going to make it difficult to hold Cemetery Hill. 
and Benner Hill also. The, troop, the troops up there are kind of cut off without, uh, without maintaining control over uh, Culp's Hill. I'm going to try and swing some troops down here. I don't know how much time I have, but uh, bringing some troops forward, hopefully to uh, retake Cemetery or Culp's Hill. I definitely need to. I've got several brigades which can, but they're all pretty under strength. So Confederates secured it again. Uh, we could swing around and surround it, hopefully. It's hard to say. The enemy enemy cavalry units are so hard to read. It seems to me like cavalry is useless, and then they seem this battle it seemed like they just totally overran my forces, so I'm not sure I'm not sure what's what's the real situation with cavalry. My flanking attack is more or less broken down. It's not been beaten back fully. I mean, it's not like we're being routed or driven from the field. But I'm not really sweeping them from the field anymore either. Uh, looks like the enemy's lost slightly more men than me, or about even. Uh, I think I had about a 10,000 man advantage before. Now we're closer to 11,000. Um, yeah, this battle is a real cluster F. Where's my core commander, anyway? We'll get Hancock up here. And we'll get uh, Howard up here. Come on, Howard. Have your boys redeem themselves for their disaster on the end of the first day of this battle. Get your morale up. Get your boys charging. Don't run away. Advance, boys. Advance. Is the first, first Corps commander even on the field? I think I've only got the two guys. That's the one thing I really wish there were more. I mean, if this battle was being fought, the first Corps commander would certainly be on the field here. He'd be in the thick of things, there's no doubt. Let's see here, the enemy cavalry's uh, trying to drive back our infantry. It's kind of a desperate affair here. A lot of my troops' morale is incredibly low. So this battle kind of drags on. I'm, I don't think I'm going to have time to retake Cemetery Hill. I've got the manpower, I just my troops don't want to fight. Their morale is all too low. You can see here most of my troops are engaging and then retreating. But we do have some troops advancing here, despite taking some artillery fire to the rear. Charge, Custer, charge! General Custer of the Little Bighorn. Charge up this impossibly difficult terrain and make a horribly unrealistic attempt to take this hill in terrain that there's no way cavalry could launch any kind of uh, charge across. Yes, do that. So they fired a volley and onward they go. Horribly unrealistic use of cavalry here. That does bug me. The idea of cavalry charging up that hill is insane. Pretty sure I'm losing way more men now. I could be wrong. Are any of these guys rallying at all? No. 20 morale is going to have to do. I don't think I've got that much time. I need to try and retake this. Oh goodness, that's a lot of enemy cavalry. Wait, Custer's here and Custer's over... Wait, how did Custer end up over here? Man, that guy rides fast. Apparently he's a three-star commander, though. So let's get him over here again. We need more charges. We need more... Wait. Oh, so it's a detachment of Custer's troops. It's not his actual force. We've got to be close to retaking this. Come on. Come on down here, General Henry Slocum. I don't think Slocum commanded a corps much longer. I think Gettysburg was one of his last battles, but I don't really know enough about him to talk about it a whole lot.
Von Glace, Graham. So it doesn't look like we have a whole lot of uncommitted troops. I do have some uncommitted artillery. The artillery was useful, and then we advanced beyond its ability to support. I don't have many troops left defending Benner Hill, that's very vulnerable, but I'm trying to retake this stupid Culp's Hill. I've got so many troops around it, the enemy looks like they have nothing, so I don't know what's taking so long. We are driving the Confederates back, and you know, despite the fact that casualties look pretty even, uh, this is the type of engagement that the Confederates really can't afford to lose the same number of men as we can. There's just no way they're going to be able to keep fighting if, if they lose a one-to-one kill-to-death ratio. They're just going to be in trouble. I'd like to get my artillery up to support, but I do think that they've got line-of-sight issues with our infantry in the way. So maybe we can get some artillery up here on Culp's Hill now that it looks like we've got a lot of guys on it. Or not infantry, cavalry. Now the enemy's threatening Benner Hill. Nice. Charge, Greg, charge! And McDougal get back up onto there. What was that just a regiment of troops? Kane? He's got 300 men. So kind of using Greg as mobile infantry up here. Culp's Hill's starting to turn, so that's good. We'll get Custer back up north in the saddle. We'll get him back in the saddle and have him, have him ride north. I don't know what kind of accent that was. It was definitely not Yankee. Come on. My troops are terribly bloodied. I've lost about 9,000 men so far. Confederacy's lost maybe 11,000? Maybe 10,000? So they're definitely losing quite a few as well. Artillery looks like their line of sight's blocked. Looks like it was a good decision to uh, kind of swing my flank out, though. Actually, that's something General Longstreet was historically worried about, and one way he tried to get out of commanding the attack on Pickett's charge was to uh, make the comment that, well, if we take my divisions on the flank of the Confederate Army, the Union, we won't have a flank, the Union can just swing around and destroy our army. His two uh, divisions, two of, two of his three divisions, had been fighting at... Uh, the little round top and Devil's Den and kind of on the far right of the Confederate line, far left of the Union line, and uh, were well fought out. And initially, Lee had talked about using them in the attack. So then he ended up using Hill's troops, which are closer to the center of the line, but putting uh, Longstreet in command of the attack anyway, despite his protests. One thing that Longstreet did uh, regret after the war was the fact that he didn't uh, more vocally protest the attack uh, at Pickett's Charge. He thought that uh, he and many other Confederate commanders in general were a little bit uh, guilty of basically treating Lee with a sort of reverence where anything that he says, you know, he must be right. He can convince us to basically do whatever uh, because he's always been right before, so uh, we should probably listen to him. And that's kind of kind of supposedly the reasoning that Longstreet gave for going along with the attack on, uh, on at Pickett's charge despite the fact that he, he was pretty opposed to it, uh, he did, um, in the end, uh, agree to go forward with it, despite his own misgivings. Not that you can just, you know, be like, oh, well, I'm not going to attack, because I don't want to. I mean, it's the military. You can't exactly just totally disobey orders. Uh, but I think, you know, he and, and others felt that maybe they were not as vocal in their opinion that it was a, a disaster waiting to happen. And, uh, again, uh, g commanders in general just kind of went along with Lee, because... Uh, he had such a brilliant track record uh, previous to this. So we're winning at Culp's Hill. The battle's being delayed. This is quite a long fight. Uh, it's going uh, well into the evening. It's uh, 7 o'clock uh, in the battle right now. Uh, it's probably closing in on a half an hour, maybe longer of playtime. I, I don't have my timer out, but I'm going to guess it's getting close to 40 minutes, actually. So Confederates still have a couple of good strong brigades here under the 1st Corps, which is Longstreet's Corps, so that's why some of those units were so large uh, and uh, well organized against me, was because they were 
units that had not been engaged thus far. That's the first battle that we've seen General Longstreet's forces engaged. Some of the troops on the right, uh, which I have been fighting as well, uh, look to be under the third corner General Hill. Those troops are a little bit more bloodied and battle wearied. Um, but uh, despite everything in this messy, messy line here, we are starting to, uh, to regain Culp's Hill. Uh, I would imagine we're going to take it back very shortly here. Uh, we just probably need to advance a little bit further. Sometimes I'm not sure. It seems like certain victory points have a certain number of troops that have to be by it to capture it. Other ones seem like they just got very particular about where your troops have to be in relation to the enemy. I mean, we held it for quite a while uh, with the enemy all over the hill, and now we're all over the hill and we can't take it fully back. So I'm not sure if there's kind of a time restriction on that or, or what's maybe causing that. Um... You know, one thing this game would be kind of cool if it represented, and I thought of this because it looks like some of these units are more gold than others, is if it represented different types of artillery, uh, which it really doesn't at this stage in the game. It's it's pretty generic in terms of muskets and equipment and things like that all seem pretty equal. I know one of the things that the game does talk about is having better Union artillery than Confederate to model history and having better equipped Union troops, but if it's modeled, it's very abstract. You don't see, you know, Union units with Springfields or Confederate units with Enfield muskets uh, really at all. It's just kind of, if, it, if it's there, it's simulated. And it's probably built into, you know, casualty ratios at certain ranges and things like that, rather than... Um, Full on. It looks like we probably have Culp's Hill now. Maybe we did take it and I didn't realize it. Rather than full on actual detail of telling you what you have. But uh, battle's most likely going to end soon. I would guess when this red line gets to the end here, it'll end. I think we've retaken Culp's Hill. It looks like it. It's pretty blue. Oh, there we go. Seized it right now. So we took Culp's Hill uh, and it says both armies are exhausted and rightly so. The Confederates have lost almost 12,000 men. We've lost uh, about 10,000 men. Uh, so another incredibly, incredibly costly battle. Again, though, manpower, you know, if the Confederates going to lose on equal or even a little bit worse than us, they're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the Union lost 10,007 men and held every objective, Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, and Benner's Hill. The Confederacy gained nothing. They did temporarily take Culp's Hill, but they ended up uh, losing the objective back at the end there. And they lost over 1,000 more men, about 1,400 more men than us. 1,402 more men. They lost 11,409 soldiers. So a major Union victory, uh, costly one at that. So let's see what's next. So it looks like the next battle, the Confederacy is going to attack a weaker Union left flank. So with all of our actions around the right flank, around Culp's Hill, our left flank is probably, or at least the Confederates are hoping, it's a little bit vulnerable. And it's going to be July 3rd, so this is going to be a alternative history battle. It's going to be basically if General Lee decided to attack the Confederate or the Union left flank rather than the center at Cemetery Hill. Um, so kind of the alternative that General Longstreet had wanted. Uh, that's not going to be in this video. It's going to be in the next. So I would imagine the 6th Corps is the one that we have fighting under Sedgwick as they are unengaged. Maybe um, maybe the 5th Corps. I'm not sure. I don't think we fought with them yet either. Confederacy, as you can see here, is only going to have about 18,000 soldiers versus almost 30,000 Union soldiers. So it's going to be difficult, uh, but it's going to be a, a historical what-if. And I think that's a very good what if to go with because if you think about it uh, the entire second day's fight was around the right and center of the lines so it would make sense if the confederate attacks failed on the right and center that they'd try the left um, so i like this uh, this what if scenario but that's getting a little bit too far into it that's going to be for the next battle uh, I do appreciate you tuning in and watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please feel to leave me a comment, a like, or whatever you want to do. Just leave it. And uh, thanks again for watching. Until next time, this is the